This is the chapter 10, lesson 2 video on comparing two means using a significance test and confidence intervals. So uh, think about how this is different and similar to when we just used one sample mean. Uh, here we have a nice picture of our normal curve. <clears throat> uh, here's our true mean, mu1 minus mu2. For a significance test, we'd center it around that. And we'd see, you know, by chance, sometimes we're going to get a value that's not exactly equal to the first mean and not exactly equal to the second, so it could vary, meaning the difference between them could, just due to chance, could vary. If we get far enough away from that middle, we're going to say that that happens so seldom that it is no longer by chance, but it shows that there's actually uh, mu1 minus mu2 does not equal zero. It's usually what we'll go with, that there is, no, the, there is a significant difference between the two means. So let's take a look at what that means in terms of a sampling distribution, and then we'll look at an example problem. So here we have an approximation of the sampling distribution of x bar 1 and x bar 2. Remember, they're approximations because they're not every possible sample of the same size. Uh, they're just uh, a large number of samples to approximate it. Now, um, here we have the difference in the means. So let's see how the, the conditions vary for one sampling distribution, which each of these is. Uh, R and then the difference. So here uh, we checked our normal condition to see if the shape is normal. We're well over 30 here, um, so we know the CLT tells us that our population is normal. Remember that central limit theorem only applies to sample means, not to proportions. Uh, we checked that for both, and then we know that our the difference is also is also normal. So it seems if this is an unbiased estimator that our true mean is somewhere around here in the center. That doesn't mean we're always going to get that value when we take a random sample. We could get values that are up here. We could get some values that are down here. Same thing for our second sampling distribution. Seems that our center's here. We could get some values that are up here by chance or down here. Now, if we got a value that was far to the right in our first sampling distribution and one that was far to the left in our second sampling distribution, that wouldn't happen a whole lot, but sometimes it would, and that would be a very big difference. So that would lead to a dot over here that shows the difference in the averages would be quite large. Now, if that were to be a legitimate claim and just happened by chance, then we could be committing a type 1 error where we um, reject the null hypothesis when it's actually true, when actually the center's here and by chance we got a value there. So keep in mind that each one of these dots represents a sample and the average of that sample. And sometimes we don't, just by chance, don't get a value that is the actual true mean. So let's look at the mean. Um, if we have an unbiased estimator, meaning the random condition is met, then the center or the mean should equal the true parameter mean. And that is the case in both of these, so it's also the case for the differences. Now, uh, here we have 56.4 as the center, because it's the mean of sampling distribution of x bar 1, or the approxim approximation to that sampling distribution. And then we have 56, 55.7, excuse me, for the second one. So to find the mean of the differences, we just subtract the two means. So 0.7 is now what the uh, sampling, the difference, the approximation of the sampling distribution of the difference in means is. Um, for spread, we check the independent condition. So we'd have to be sampling from a population that's at least 10 times as large if we're sampling without replacement. We'd also have to have one value not affect another. Then, remember that this one's a bit tricky. This is where more variables, more variance. So we're subtracting the values, but the uh, standard deviations don't add, the variances do. So we have to get the standard deviation of each, square it. So square 0.78 right now on your calculator, add that to 1.34 squared, and then take the square root of that answer and you'll get our standard deviation down here. So more variables, more variance. Add variances to get that. This is also in your book, so take a look at 10.2 to get a better example of that. Let's look at our example problem. So we've got baseball season starting up in the next week, week and a half. And I've always been curious about thinking back to when the big home run hitting started in baseball. So there are a lot of rumors about steroids taking over baseball as home run totals skyrocketed. Um, so one player, Sammy Sosa, he was uh, battling Mark McGuire for the home run record prior to uh, the time when Barry Bonds broke the, the record for one season. Um, so they were both hitting far more home runs than they had before. 
Uh, later on, it was found that Sosa had been using steroids and a corked bat, or supposedly had been using steroids and a corked bat, that um, the bat broke and they found cork in it, which helps you hit the ball farther. So, could Major League Baseball have used a significance test in order to determine whether further, further investigation was in order? So let's take a look at the data from the seasons before that 1998 season and the season after. So one clear lurking variable is the number of at-bats you have per season. So if you get more at-bats, if you play longer, you're likely to hit more home runs. It's just you have more opportunity to hit home runs. So to count for that here, what I did was do at-bats per home run. Uh, so we see how many at-bats it took on average that season for, um, per home run. So I took the total at-bats. And at bats count as any time you have a plate appearance where you don't walk or sacrifice. Um, so you're either striking out, grounding out, flying out, or getting a hit of some sort. Um, and how many times you hit home runs. So here we have the total at bats, the total home runs, and then the number in bold here is the at bats per home run. That's what we're going to pay attention to. Uh, this one's going to go into L1. This one's going to go into L2. Uh, so you can try this test with data as well as statistics. I also have the averages down here, appro approximate averages. So just looking at the data, we can see we have some very big numbers up here. Uh, much smaller numbers down here in the years in question. So 98 was that season when McGuire and Sosa were racing for it. So let's see what a significance test would look like for this. So I'd like you to conduct an appropriate significance test in order to see if the difference in average at bats per home run is, in fact, significant. So we're going to use the same strategy of state, plan, do, and conclude, and then a confidence interval. So let's see what's involved with that, and then we'll come right back to the problem. So a quick reminder about the conditions. We have random, which is the center, which we looked at before. Um, so we need an SRS for both, um, both of the sampling distributions, so both of the samples that are taken. And then the normal condition has to be met for both of the samples. Uh, remember, if the population is normal, you're good to go. If not, look for the central limit theorem, which is that if sample sizes are large enough and is greater than or equal to 30, only for sample means, not for sample proportions, then uh, the normal conditions met, meaning our sampling distribution is approximately normal. If that is not, if those two are not met, then you look to see if it's robust. Now, in the case of our problem, one set of data, they're both less than 15, one set of data has some skew but no outliers. The other is roughly symmetrical. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and assume they're robust just to see how it holds up. We could remove some outliers from the one that has some skew and see how it goes from there. I could take off the first two years of his career when he's a rookie and look at it from there if we wanted to do further investigation to see how that affected our p-value. Uh, and then independence. One season shouldn't affect another. And if we're sampling without a replacement, then we want to make sure that the 10% condition is met. Um, and then here we have the, so in our case, it's one season not affecting another. Uh, more variables, even though we're subtracting the two, more variance. We add the variances and then square root that sum, um, that sum to find the standard deviation. Remember the central limit theorem right here only applies to sample means, not sample proportions. We look at NP being greater than or equal to 10 or N times 1 minus P being greater than or equal to 10 for proportions. And in the case of intervals, confidence intervals for them, we look at P hat or significance tests for two proportions. So to form a confidence interval, we would take the difference in the two averages. We'd subtract plus or minus our critical value. Remember, zap tax is Z for a proportion, T for a sample mean. The only time we can use Z for a sample mean is if we know the true population standard deviation. And then we multiply that by the standard error, which we added the variances of each data set and square rooted. Notice we're not using pooling. There's no pooling here for sample means. And just know that we're not going to use that. So on your calculator, you want to go to stat test two sample t int for the t interval. To do a two sample t test, same function, stat test two sample t test. Uh, what we're doing is saying, our null hypothesis is usually there's no difference. So the, the um, mu1 minus mu2, if they're equal, that would equal 0. So how far is our, are the difference in our sample means from 0 in terms of our standard deviation? And again, more variables, more variance. We're dividing by the sum of the variances square rooted, because that's the standard deviation of the difference in means. So when our null hypothesis is a statement of no difference, which it generally is, 
then this becomes zero and it would just t would just look like this. Now if we had a one-sided test, which ours is, our hypothesis is going to be the number of at bats per home run went down, meaning he needed less at bats uh, to hit a home run um, in the years in question. So it'd be one sample uh, it'd be a one-sided test where it's we're looking at the p-value being on the left. If the alternative were greater than, it'd be on the right. And if it was two-sided, not equal to, we'd have looking at both sides. Just see if uh, what percent of the time values are that far or further away from the true value. So here's your multiple choice question. Uh, so go ahead and pause right now. I just touched on this earlier in the video um, about what is uh, the central limit theorem and does it apply to proportions, sample means, or both. So now is a good time to work on the multiple choice. Pause it. Look back in the video if you need to. You can also look back in your book. Um, at early on when we looked at the central limit theorem for sampling distributions in chapter 7 or now in chapter 10.1 and 10.2. Pause here and then we're going to get back to the example question. So we're going to conduct a significance test in order to see if the difference in average at-bats per home run is significant. Uh, here we have 89 to 97, here we have 98 to 2004. Take a look at them and see what you think just by looking at the averages and the standard deviations. Uh, keep in mind, anytime you see a problem like this, if you're not given state plan, do and conclude, write them down and fill them in as needed. So state plan, do conclude. Let's do the first part, and I'll let you finish the question. So state will let everybody know we're conducting a significance test of the following hypotheses at the alpha equals 0.05 significance level. Uh, remember, you don't have to write your hypotheses both of these ways. Either way is fine. That mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. That's their equal. The statement of no difference. No difference would mean they're equal. This is no difference. They're equal. The alternative being that mu1 is greater than mu2, uh, which that says here or here if we're looking in terms of a difference. Now, I came up with mu1 being greater than mu2 because we're looking at bats per home run. And the theory was, uh, did, he, did Sammy Sosa start doing something that allowed him to use less at bats to hit a home run, uh, which is what you know people would say steroids or corking the bat would let you do. Then we define mu1 and mu2. Mu1 is going to be the mean, true mean number of at bats per home run Sammy Sosa would have under the conditions in which he played during 1989 to 1997. And mu2, uh, which is the same thing, but uh, for 98 to 2004. Uh, we're treating, treating the sam samples as random. Um, in sports, that's uh, what we can do. That's all we can do. We have the whole data set there for those years, and we're seeing if there's a significant difference. We don't know the population is normal. N is less than 30 for both data sets, so we graph them. Uh, the red data set from 98 to 2004 is roughly symmetric. No outliers. The blue data set, uh, it has no outliers, but there's some skew there. So uh, we're going to conduct the test and see what happens. We could remove some outliers, uh, like a couple of the first early years, to see um, how that would change things. And that'd be a nice follow-up for you to do on this one. So let's continue on. So you're going to go ahead and do the do step and conclude step, as well as find a confidence interval and say whether it agrees with your significance test or not. So I would like you to use a, we have a sample means, so we have two of them, so a two sample. We're using T, we don't know the true population standard deviation, two sample T test. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use these averages uh, that I already have in here for you and the standard deviations here. If you're using the data, remember we'd put the first data set into L1, the second into L2, and we'd say data. Um, think about, look back to our null hypothesis that I gave you, so you can see what you'd put in uh, in terms of the data set 1, data set 2. In your free response, I'd like you to write what t equals, the p-value you get, the degrees of freedom, which is a little complicated to calculate, so use your calculator. Then conclude in context, meaning do you reject or fail to reject, uh, comparing alpha and the p-value you get, and then what confidence interval do you get for this using a two sample t int, and does this agree with your significance test, why or why not? So pause right now, look back in the video if you need to, and look over the lesson in 10.2. This outline will also be posted, so check through that and then answer the free response.